Professor Saxon is someone for whom I own much because he was my professor at UCLA when I was completing my dissertation. Beyond that, we've developed quite a warm relationship over the years, and, and so I'm very pleased to be able to have Alex uh, share some of his insights with you. Alex was born in Connecticut and raised on the East Coast, had quite an outstanding education, ranging from Philip Exeter to Harvard University. He got tired of Harvard and moved on to the University of Chicago. So these were all institutions that are East Coast branches of Mason College. <laughs> then after some time at the uh, University of Chicago, Alex decided he wanted to pursue some different ways of living. And so he moved out here to California and engaged in working with various labor movements, including working with Harry Bridges on the docks in San Francisco, and also worked with carpenters unions up in the northern uh, San Francisco Bay Area, actually I guess with the uh, business agent or, or uh, shop steward. For Not the, neither one. I was a um, local press, local press a period of time. Um, uh, carpenters unions. I was involved actively in trying to organize a working class in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. While he was working on this, his wife, whom he met in Chicago, Trudy Saxton, worked as a social worker. Actually, their first residence, married together, was Hull House in Chicago, uh, which for some of you may seem like a mystery, but it was one of the settlement houses organized in the 1880s, 1890s by some of the progressive reform movements. And Jane Adams was the initiator of that institution. While Alex was working in as a labor organizer, and Trudy was working as a social worker in the Bay Area. Alex also decided he wanted to write in the area of fiction, and so he wrote several novels, among which are two that have recently been reissued. So this was a formidable accomplishment to write two novels in the late 1940s and 1950s that are reissued 50 years later. One is The Great Midland, which was just released by University of Illinois Press, and it's the second issue, the reissue. And then Bright Web in the Darkness is coming out from the University of California Press later this month. While a uh, organizer in the labor movement, Alex was concerned about concepts of ideology and developing a historical understanding of the position of the labor movement in American history and the development of American political economy, and ultimately this led Alex to think about the possibility of going back to the University of California at Berkeley and concluding graduate studies at UC Berkeley. And there he uh, completed a dissertation which worked on the issues of anti-Chinese agitation among workers in California in the mid-19th century to the late 19th century. And this became the subject matter of his first scholarly historical book indispensable enemy. And this book also has recently just been republished by UC Press and is available. This is a book when, which, uh, when I was attending UCLA myself, I used to see students selling even at card tables along the uh, uh, walkway, road walk, as well as the which had been used in the, in the courses. But it's a book that's widely read by students. I still think that while it is uh, about 30 years old now, that it is one of the outstanding works in California history. Uh, more recently, Alex published The Rise and Fall of the White Republic, which is an examination of race and ideology and culture in uh, the United States. And uh, Alex right now is, is working on some speculative writing about the role of religion in American life. So I've asked Alex to come and speak to us today. I'm sure he could, he could uh, entertain us and provide us thoughtful insight for quite a while, but he's going to speak to us for about an hour uh, concerning various issues under the topic Utopian Imagination in History and Fiction. And then I'm sure many of you will have questions, and Alex has promised that he will be willing to share some of his, his uh, ideas with you in the form of a uh, question and answer period at the end. So, welcome, and uh, please do your results next time. Well, okay, Jonathan, thank you very much for that introduction. Can you hear me out, out there? Okay, the machinery is working, that's good. Um, 
I've been here before. I think this is my, my third uh, visit, and I've always enjoyed coming here. It's a pleasure to be here again, and in considerable part, perhaps totally in part, I owe that to Professor McLeod. Uh, and I owe him a number of other things, too, as well as uh, to many graduate students. Graduate teaching, I guess this should be said about graduate, all teaching, <coughs> start to the finish, is always a two-way thing. You uh, hope that you're giving something and uh, you know that you're getting a lot of stuff back from the experiences, responses, sharing with the students. Well, uh, I'm almost 80 years old as of, as of, this isn't my birthday, but as of this year. And about half of my adult life, let's see, 80 years takes us back to 1919. That's when I was born. It takes us back a little bit more than just under that. About half of my adult life I've spent as a historian, so I suppose it's appropriate for me to talk about the history of that time period, now almost a century, but what I'll be focusing on especially will be the last 50 years, the part that I remember from the time when I was an adolescent in New York up to the present. So this is a bit of a historical retrospect. Since I was here last, which was about two years ago, I guess, was it something like that, uh, some things have happened that are, are signal events for me. Jonathan referred to them. I now have four books in print all at the same time, which is uh, uh, sort of incredible to me because the first two, one of them has been out of print for almost 50 years and the other one for 30 years. So it's a pleasure to have them out. The works in history are more recent than the, well, one of them could be indispensable enemy, the book about the anti-Chinese movement in California on the West Coast, came out in 1970, so that itself is, uh, we've got 35 years there, that was, was just reissued happily by the University of California Press. So I'm going to be talking a little bit, in fact quite a lot, about those books as a historian for 30 years. I talked mostly about other people's books, and now that I'm retired I can <laughs> we're going to talk about my, my own books, and then I'll, I'll take the, the advantage of the, this occasion to do so. I have to get my glasses out here. So I'll be talking about personal experience to a good extent. I'm going to reminisce about just some fairly minor incidents and episodes. But what I really want to focus on is how the, the effort to it doesn't seem to be pitched with anything. How the effort to cope and absorb and interpret, understand those experiences relates to writing. I began writing fiction and uh, I won't say ended up, but now I'm writing history. And I won't say the two are the same thing, although some of my hostile critics have suggested that I do. But, uh, I think they're quite different, but they also obviously, well, it isn't obvious, but I think they have um, important things in common. And in the title of this lecture, which I'd better explain a little bit, I express that by the term utopia, the utopian imagination of history and fiction. So let me say a word or two about what I mean or what my mental connections are with the term utopia, and then I'll go on some personal experience. By utopia, I don't mean something that's, uh, that's divorced from the experiences of life. I don't mean something that's abstracted and remote and fuzzy-headed. Utopians are often criticized or attacked as being out of this world and not in touch with reality. I think utopia is a, the, the notion, the ideas that kind of stem around it, or center around that word are part of the human condition. I don't think there's probably any human being that's ever existed since the beginning of the species who didn't look at the conditions of life that that person he or she was living and feel that it could be better and that it wasn't impossible for it to be better. And that maybe it could be better through, uh, and this may be a more modern idea, but I think it's propped up in ancient times too, through what people did, what they thought said later on what they wrote. So I think the idea of, of utopia is almost contained within the concept of human consciousness. 
this is much broader than just uh, somebody who specializes in writing green reviews of the future. And it includes for me both the aspirations that are expressed in religious ideas and the aspirations that are expressed in political ideas. And both of these go way, way back. There's some tension between these two ways of expressing them. There's also a great deal of overlap. You'll have to bear with me. I'm going to give you several quotations, not this instant, but to Here's one of the expressions of the utopian attitude that came to my mind when I first began thinking about it. I'm quoting, well, I'll tell you what I'm quoting in a minute. Uh, down there, beginning at the further bound of Beelzebub's dim tomb, there is a space not known by sight, but only by the sound, <coughs> of a little stream descending through the hollow. It has eroded from the massive stone in its endlessly entwining lazy flow. My guide, my guide, by the way, was, was Virgil. This is Dante describing his uh, ascent, not descent, but ascent from, from, per, uh, from uh, the inferno. And I crossed over and began to mount that little known and lightless road to ascend into the shining world again. He's been down on this long journey, which he undertook in part to save his own soul, but in part, uh, maybe a larger part, in the hopes that he could be, so this is the, the fictional aspect of it, I suppose, could be a messenger of both accusation and hope uh, to bring back to his fellow mortals when he returned to the surface again. My guide and I crossed over and began to mount that little known lightless road to ascend into the shining world again. He first, I second. Without thought of rest, we climbed the dark until we reached the point where a round opening brought in sight the blessed and beauteous shining of the heavenly realm. And we walked out once more beneath the stars. Well, for Dante, and I won't spend very much time on Dante, clearly the, the, shining, the shining realm, the utopian hope, was in heaven, it was not in this world. And yet the two are not separate because is concepts of bliss in heaven centered around a very mortal love, which he had for a young woman he had known earlier in his life who was dead. So the great deal of the imagery of heaven, of the, the metaphor, is related to the human experience of love, if one wants to look at the overlap in a slightly different way, is blistering description of what hell is like, is to me, very reminiscent of what an Italian walled city was like when I first saw one as a small child at the end of the depression. That was hell within, within the walls. Dirt, cruelty, this isn't just Italian cities, I'm not sure to specify the nationality it's because Dante was Italian. He was describing the social scene and it was exaggerated tortures of hell, but the people he placed there were people he had actually known. The crimes he described were the things they had done, and some of which he had done himself in everyday life. So the message is hope and aspiration for perfection through salvation in the future, but also a, a, it's embedded within the, the social experience of Dante as a, as a resident of a late medieval medieval city in northern Italy. Let me come out to my second putting in position quotation. This is a little bit later. I won't tell you the title of the author of this for a minute, but it's a short poem. And I'll do the best I can. I'm not a, a, not a great renderer of poetry, especially with my glasses on. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's hillsides green? And was the holy lamb of God in England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon these clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here? And then a sharp break, in closing my own words. The beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Amid these dark, satanic mills, mills. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. 
a whole bevy of quotations and movie titles and everything else from those four lines. I will not cease from mental flight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green, pleasant land. Well, that's, of course, Blake writing at the end of the 18th century. And the experience he's describing, he was intensely religious, but he was also a political radical in many ways. He was regarded by the English government as being quite a dangerous individual. In fact, they put him, put him briefly in jail. But at any rate, the combination of utopian aspiration, both in terms of, of the way society could be on Earth, to we have built Jerusalem, England's green and pleasant land, and the religious motivation for that. So here the two are overlapping and interlocked. Now for my third quotation, actually, I decided not to use it because the author is not very easy to quote from, and that's Karl Marx, which would come in only a few, uh, only barely one generation after, uh, after Blake. And there I would have quoted from the Communist Manifesto or any of many, 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 many other pages. But when I went through the Communist Manifesto, I didn't see anything that was readable in a short time that I could really detach from. So I'll just call on your knowledge or recollection about or about the Communist Manifesto and quote you a couple of uh, lines partially. Working men in the world unite, and nothing, you have nothing to lose but your chains. I don't think that's in the Communist Manifesto. Is, is, is it? Okay, well. Um, is that the last, the last line? You have nothing to lose but your chains. You're, you're oppressed. Uh, if you revolt, you won't lose anything very serious and you won't like rise. So this is a very secular approach. This is calling for world revolution. And in terms of my own experience, born in 1919, I've given now the two poles of, uh, of uh, utopian outlook. We can refer to Blake or Dante for one, Marx for the other. Overlap, indeed there is. Uh, Marx's work, like Blake's in this respect, is absolutely embedded in social experience and studies of the impact of industrialization. And yet Marx, a number of years after writing the Communist Manifesto, could write about the Paris working people who seized power briefly at the end of the Franco-Prussian War in Paris Commune and speak of them as having stormed the gates of heaven. If, uh, why would he use that metaphor again? Because there, there's overlap. They stormed the gates of heaven. Heaven was where um, all good things were. And in the world as Marx perceived it, all those good things were in the hands of capitalist exploiters. So the only thing that the working people could do, and he hailed them as heroes in the same way that uh, perhaps have hailed the angels who stormed the gates of heaven as heroes. He hailed them as heroes of human <coughs> aspiration. Well, okay, so that's uh, a little bit on what I was thinking, why I picked the term utopia. Now, here we're moving from giants to, uh, you know, people like ourselves, and, and we cope with it as best we can, and I can cope with that as best I could in some of my works, and I'll talk about that. But aside from what we produced, the immortal works as compared to what uh, us low immortals actually have been able to produce here. The experiences are not so different. I'm tell you about that. I'll take you back to the, um, the time when I arrived at adult consciousness, which was the midst of the Great Depression. To be yes. I grew up in New York City. To my good luck, I grew up in a middle class family. So that I didn't uh, actually go hungry at any point. We had to live on scant circumstances sometimes. So the things I remember from that period are things that were I saw happening to other people. New York in the 1930s, you couldn't walk for more than uh, three or four blocks, especially in the early morning, without coming on a bread line that surrounded an entire block, where working people and old men and women women with their children stood in line at the door of a soup kitchen and gradually, step by step, they worked their way around the block until they came to where the handout was. And that would carry them through until supper time and they'd line up again.
again and let it out and then go through the same process. That was the depression. Enormous numbers of people out of work, evicted from their homes, drifting, living in cities and shanties or out in the, what we call facetiously Hoover bills, which were usually out in the city dump where people who were unemployed could put together enough old junk to build some kind of a shelter. And every city and town of any size had its Hoover bills where people who were homeless. We have Hoover bills now, we don't call them. I don't know what we should have done. What's the difference between the two? We live in an incredibly affluent society where the income is rising. The Great Depression, there were certainly very wealthy people. But in looking back, it seems to me that one of the differences was, at least for people in my situation, I can't speak of somebody like the, the Rockefeller children. There was an identification with the people and a sense of being just one step from their situation. There was a much less willingness at that time, in spite of the fact that all of us, my parents and people of my generation, had been raised on the myth, shall we say, of American self-sufficiency. There was a much greater willingness to recognize that people who were unemployed were not morally delinquent and didn't necessarily deserve what was happening. So there was a sense of identity, of identification. And I'll come to this in a minute or two when I talk about the rise of the labor movement, the CIO. There was also a vast sense of hope. It was a, 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 a utopian aspiration that related to the tremendous mass movements that were developing both in rural areas and in cities at the time. But okay, so back to the vignettes, the bread lines, I remember Walk, coming home from school one time, I lived about six blocks from Union Square. Union Square is a term that probably won't mean much to anybody who's under 50. But Union Square was, uh, was a big plaza in New York. It was named not for labor unions, but for the, the preservation of the Union during the Civil War. Unionism. Union Square. This was a place where radical organizations and the radical wing of the labor movement often put on huge demonstrations demanding such things as unemployment compensation, maybe even demanding health coverage, although that was so far remote that people didn't even talk about that much of the time. But unemployment insurance and old age retirement and so on, demanding things like this and demanding relief because of the so I can remember walking up towards Union Square. The square was absolutely filled with people, solidly paid heads and hats and shoulders and overcoats. You couldn't get anywhere near it. All the streets were, were uh, had little squadrons of uh, mounted police and were champing, clamping their, their hooks on the pavement and so on, in case they should be called into action. I remember looking up, the Union Square was still is surrounded by six and seven story buildings that had uh, what were called lofts in those days. They're still there and all often they were coming apartments rather than lofts, but lofts were flat parts of a building that would be used by a small industry like uh, clothing workers or some clothing manufacturing firm. And up on the cornices of the buildings were the police again, not with horseback, on horseback, but with machine guns. Looking at this, this is the 1930s and out of this before the bombs, but going to become the festival of violence of the Second World War. So those are a, a, a vignette or two of, of my recollections, I'd say. I'm still a child at this time. Um, and of course this affected the way I reacted to education and to Harvard, for example. This is a little bit beside the point, but after what Jonathan said, I can't resist telling you that when I was at Harvard as a junior, decided I had, I, for my preservation, I had to get out of, of New England situation in which I was closed in. This was my own fault. There were a lot of marvelous things at Harvard. But I had no way of finding out they were there. So I thought the only way I could do was to get out of it and go someplace far away, which was Chicago. I thought Chicago and far west were about the same. I could probably east, east of the Hudson. So I went to my advisor, who was a professor of economics, I've forgotten his name, and told him that I was transferring. I hadn't been thrown out. So he made an appointment with me to come back for a longer talk, and we talked a little bit. As I was getting up to leave, passed something across to me. 
I looked at it after I went out, and it was a card to a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> the reputation of the University of Chicago in those days, which was what I was transferring to, was not high at Harvard. I don't know how it is nowadays. Anyway, they did go to Chicago, and a lot of good things happened to me there. I met my wife, and I'm still married to her. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here today. But uh, some things that weren't so good, too. Chicago was in the grips of the Depression. And so the somewhat distant impressions that I had had in New York were fortified by much more real, direct experiences. When I graduated in 1940, jobs were not plentiful, although thanks to the war in Europe, they were beginning to pick up. But uh, I went to work in steel mills, and I worked on the railroads for quite a time, and I wandered around some. And one of the wanderings I did was to ride a boxcar out west. I'd never been, previously, I'd never been west of the Hudson at this point. I'd never west of the Chicago River, but I got rode a boxcar out to the west coast and hitchhiked and, and rode, on, rode on rails, as it was called, rode the, rode the boxcars. And all the trains, especially in harvest season, and this was fall, flat cars and boxcars and everything else were loaded with men, very few women, but loaded with men, wandering around. These were harvest workers in this case. This was Northern Illinois and Wisconsin, and then briefly I got into North Dakota, who hoped that in the Red River, great rain country, there'd be jobs and they could earn a few bucks. And generally they'd get to the place where they were going, the harvest would be a little earlier, it hadn't come quite due yet, and they'd have to turn around and go back. So I remember getting on this boxcar at daybreak in Fargo, North Dakota, and I couldn't go up to I can't remember the name of the town, but it's very close to the Canadian border from the northern part of the Red River Valley. It's supposed to be a big harvest season. And the boxcar was empty and empty of cargo, but it was absolutely jammed. It must have been 30 or 40 people sitting around and the flies buzzing in in enormous numbers. And the train chugged along and took about three hours to go 20 miles. And finally, we came to a little town that was about halfway to Grand Forks. That's where I was heading. And I thought, this will take forever. I'm from something more adventurous. So I got off the, the box, the freight train, which had pulled off onto the siding, and uh, a passenger train with a mail car on it came roaring in on the main line. And I went around the side of it and got on the, the first coach right behind the engine, the first time I'd ever done that. And uh, the train took off and we went like lightning towards Grand Forks. And then a man came up behind me who had done the same thing. It was another hobo. Sense. And he said, when we get into Grand Forks, the cops will be waiting, and you have to jump off first before the train comes to a stop. I did just a little bit. And with these steps going down, he said, well, this wasn't the kind of car that had a vestibule door. So I was ahead of him, unfortunately. I should have let him first, go first, but I a little more, more thoughtful. And I was down on the bottom of the step, leaning out and looking at everything, rushing at us, you know, and the train's still going, it seemed to be Amazingly fast. He said, Good, get, get off, get off. So finally, I took my knife in my hands and jumped off. And of course, I went head over heels for about three somersaults on the gravel bank. And when I got to him, I didn't hurt myself, fortunately, except for bruises and bare knuckles. Well, the end of the train was going out of sight, and I don't know whatever happened to him, but I was not within reach of the cops, so I <coughs> got up and walked in the ground floor and pulled up the fence. Um, the next day, I decided to give up the railroad and hitchhike. And the first ride I got was from a man with his family who had come into town with the produce of his year's work, which was a couple of sacks of grain. And he had sold this and had a few bucks in his pocket. And his car was, this was 38 or 39, was 10 or 12 years old already. So this car was so he picked me up and gave me a ride, and we went for a few miles, and the car stopped. Well, I knew absolutely nothing about cars, and it turned out he didn't know much either. And I had had the experience, my brother, older brother, had done an old model A4, and one time it had stopped, and we had thought it had a carburetor trouble, and we took the hood off the carburetor, and I put my hand on the top of the van, and it started up. So I did this, and it worked. I, I was doing 
to me totally surprising. But he took it as, you know, this, this kid really knows about the farm. <laughs> so we chugged along and got to his farm, tenant, tenant farm in, in North Dakota. The bleakest place I've almost ever seen in my life. And he offered me a job as, well, not quite as a hired man, but if I would help him, I told him I was a carpenter, which was a lie too. But if I would help him repair the wagon that was broken, I could uh, live there and keep the food and so on. So I agreed to that. I, I stayed overnight. I shared a bed in the attic with, I think, three little male children. And what we had was fat back and, and cornbread for Leo. Some bacon bread was poured over. This was what this family lived on. And this wasn't, I had lived during the Depression, but I hadn't lived like that. Uh, there's a lot of, in some ways, this is a comic story and it could easily be funny. But uh, anyway, what happened next was that we got up in the morning. He was, had to move to another tenant farm house. He was being evicted. This was the end of the season. And fence posts were so scarce in North Dakota where there aren't many trees growing that he had taken down the wire to cheat fence to think he had a cow and horse. And he wanted to get all those posts up. So he sent me out with his wagon and his old beat down horse to bring in the posts. And if I had a pickaxe and they just popped right out of the ground and put them on the wagon. That took a short time, it wasn't a really big deal. And then I got on the wagon and started back. Meanwhile, the neighbor, a huge Scandinavian farmer, had come with a bottle of beer under each arm. And they were sitting, having beer on the porch steps. So as the horse pulling the wagon got close to the turn-in, it realized it was going home to the barn, and it began to gather speed, and pretty soon it was it cranked itself up to practically full gallop. And I was on the seat trying to pull back, and I saw the barn coming towards me with the level at the top of the door about at my waist, and the two farmers put down their beer bottle and yelled, jump! <laughs> so I went over backwards into the bed of the truck and got through without, uh, without uh, damage. And at the end of that, it was obvious that I wasn't a carpenter, and I knew there was not much of a kind of running horse anyway. And I knew that as soon as we started to repair the wagon, I wasn't going to be much good either. He had no tools and no wood, nothing to repair it. And I was, even the food he had, I didn't feel I was quite right to eat it up. So I said, well, I, I'll have to move on. So the farmer who had come in took me down to the main road, which was several miles away. And what I will say for this is that though there were some funny aspects. I've never forgotten the bleak look of that house since I left in the late afternoon in the fall day. Absolutely bare country, a few dead trees that some earlier New Deal program put in his wind breaks and now had perished for lack of water. And this house in which the entire fruit of a year's work had been sold for a few bucks. So that was, that was, that was uh, some vignettes of the Depression. I'm going to go on time, that's okay. I'm going to read you another quote. This uh, comes from a uh, novelist, not me, uh, but one of them knew, about 10 years older than I, or 15, probably how fast, it's going to be familiar with him. He was very well known in the 30s as a radical writer. And here he's explaining the impact of the Depression. He grew up as a working class kid in New York, same area, but from a different class background, so his experiences were quite different. In 1932, he writes, I worked as a messenger in a Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. It was one of a series of dismal and underpaid jobs that I had held since at the age of 11. Pressed by the need of our utter poverty, I went to work as a newspaper delivery boy. The fact that thereby I gave up all the joy and laughter of childhood to embark upon long years of physical and mental weariness, the particular weariness of doomed children that Jack London in his short stories has described so well, is important only in its very broad social sense. If we are to seek understanding, or any, or any sort of understanding, through this doctrine, he's referring to the book he's going to write, uh, 
then the reader must not only recall the 1930s, but must comprehend the full meaning of the surrender of childhood, a situation that poverty still imposes on millions of children the world over. This was written in the 1960s, probably late 1960s, so it isn't that ancient. The fact that I had earned $25 an hour at this job at the library is not the crucial thing, for my 25 cents was precious beyond belief. And when I bought apples, it was one of the great uh, breakthroughs of the Hoover administration, particularly the early New Deal, was to provide apples from, from Midwestern farms to unemployed people in the cities to sell. And there they would sit with their little bundle of apples on a folding chair or step or something essentially begging to sell the apples. So apple selling became again kind of a metaphor for the Depression experience. I bought apples from one or another of the thousands of much older men who had lost all the proceeds of a lifetime. I felt that I was lucky. I do not try to account in any way for my good fortune. It was accidental to say. At an age earlier than I can remember, I found a passion and love that was to remain with me all my life. I entered the world of books. I read everything, and thereby perhaps found my own salvation. I read not with taste, with any discrimination or selection, but simply with hunger and lust. A book was a book. I read it when I had it. In this library, where I worked in 1932, there was a gentle and wise librarian who was willing to read stories I had written and begun writing. It doesn't explain how I got to do that. And to say something about them to me. In particular, in particular, to wonder where in my writing was my own life and my own experience. Were these not fit subjects for me to write about? I, I, when I say I, I'm paraphrasing from, from uh, how fast at this point. I respond, well, there's nothing in my life that's worth writing about. It's just rad and pointless. I don't want to be like Robert Louis Stevenson and people like that and write great adventure stories. Um, whereupon the librarian, a woman, she showed me for the first time the writings of radical critics of society. And then, when suddenly a vision of sanity and order and hope burst upon her, it, she gave me Shaw's wonderful book to read, which I have to confess I've never read, maybe some of you have, The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism. A facetious title of a serious book. Fast writes, I read it through in one night, and then Shaw was my idol and teacher forever afterwards. The passage that I read you began with this sentence. I joined the Communist Party in 1943, but I came to it first as a part of my experience of my generation. So that's that's a, a glimpse of that similar similar area in New York. I had a different background, as I said. I came out of a luckier family. I didn't go hungry or have to uh, uh, scrounge around in the, in the streets looking for casual work, as, as how we fast did. But in other ways, our experiences were quite simple. I was about 10 years younger than Howard Fast, and joined the Communist Party actually about three years earlier than he did in 1939 or 40. And that becomes central to a great deal of my experience since then. Um, I've got a little bit slightly ahead of my, uh, my uh, agenda here. But uh, the, the Communist Party decision was one that was, seems in 19... 97, bizarre to say the least. But as Howard Fast points out, in 1932 it was not bizarre. This was a world in which the Communist Party, both in the United States and other places, was playing an extraordinary leading role. It was certainly a center of controversy. It was the, seen to many people, let's put it this way, as a wave of the future and seemed as the possible expression of the kind of utopian aspirations that were brought forward in Marx's quotation and even in the 
quotation from Blake that I read you earlier. A world in which within the actual existing social structure, something like utopia, maybe not absolutely utopia, but something like that could be achieved. This had an enormous power for people who had had the experience, as the people in the 1932 period did. And a great many young working class kids like Howard Fast and a great many young students like myself went that route. And it had a powerful shape and impact on our experience. Now, not everything in the 1930s, I would take a watch also and keep an eye on, not everything in the 1930s was all bleak by any means. And there was a sense, as I suggested, I think, a few minutes ago, enormous upsurges of hope and hopefulness. I won't attempt to deal with the world scene at this point, but focusing on the United States, the rise of an industrial labor movement was something that was absolutely new in American history and something that inspired both working people and young students or older intellectuals with hope and aspiration. Now, the labor movement had always resisted industrial exploitation in the United States, but the labor movement previous to this period had been a movement that contained largely fairly privileged craft, skilled workers who were almost entirely white and built into it, as I later learned, was built into the entire American society, was an absolute, an almost total racist exclusion. The labor movement was all white. Now, people who worked in the new mass production industries, like automobile and oil, and huge industries that were taking shape in the 20s and 30s after the First World War, were not skilled workers, they were not craft workers, and they were not all white. And many of them were European immigrants who were not really accepted into the old craft union tradition. So what the CIO did with the aid of the New Deal, or it can be all around if you want, uh, in the 1930s was for the first time to successfully organize the huge numbers of industrial workers in Detroit and Chicago and Indianapolis and all these other industrial cities who had not been brought into the old craft unions and did not possess craft skills, who were of ethnic backgrounds like Polish and Jewish and Eastern European and hadn't really raised the strong and penetrated into the existing craft unions. And also another kind of recent American especially since the First World War, Marx. So that regardless of the racist traditions in the labor movement, the industrial effort to organize industrial workers necessarily and also ideologically as there were many people who advocated this as a matter of justice, favored a non-discriminatory policy. So the CIO was not only locked in this conflict with the older labor and with the political right of the Hoover Republican parties of the Republican Party, I should say, of that, that period, it was also locked in conflict over, over the question of race. The CIO was not unanimous on this. It was a struggle being fought out within particular individual CIO units. Now, this was a, a, an upsurge of, of, of hope and of optimism that countered the bleak picture that the industrial, uh, the industrial depression presented. But it had as its central theme, in a sense, and this became deeply impressed on me as I went to work in steel mills and in the railroads in Chicago. The problem of race, and it was through this that I realized what I had not learned at Harvard studying history, what I had not learned at the University of Chicago where I made in history, that racial discrimination was absolutely central to American culture. I've spoken about the labor movement because that's where I first came in contact with But uh, there were no blacks at Harvard. I learned many years later, actually, after I joined the Communist Party and read communist literature, that W.E.B. Du Bois was the first black PhD ever graduated from Harvard, but nobody at Harvard said that or something about that. Actually, I was born in the same town Du Bois was born in Western Massachusetts. Nobody ever told me that this was where Du Bois had come from. I wouldn't know at the time who Du Bois was. So there was a whole, a whole section of history that had been lost there. 
Now let me give you a vignette or two that focuses on this particular aspect. When I had several jobs on various different railroads, I, this happened for various reasons, but I wound up with a fairly complete picture of what the industry was like, especially if you were on the bottom side of it. I don't know what it was like for the heroines and so on. For the people working in railroad yards, it was very much as I saw it. And there was an absolute line. This was old, these were old craft unions that had been around since long before the day, days of deaths. And there was an absolute sharp line between white and black. The skilled trades, boilermakers, uh, trainmen, conductors, switchmen, were white. And the people who did the unskilled labor on the tracks, they were mostly Mexican in Chicago area. The people who worked in the roundhouse, swabbing off the engines with big hoses out of the cold wind is on the blacks. So the unskilled work was done by blacks and the, the skilled work was done, done by whites. Uh, one of the things I participated in which became a central aspect of the novel written was an effort just before the United States got into the war to implement President Roosevelt's fair employment practices order. It was not an act of Congress, it was an order in which he sort of expressed the hope that there would be no racial discrimination in the industries and shipyards that the war was going to stimulate. So in Chicago, and this was done in many other places too, groups of us who were sympathetic to this cause, some communists and some, got together and organized efforts to raise legal proof to show that there was discrimination. So we would set up a situation where a black worker would go around to apply for a job as a railroad train, which took on skilled workers at this point if they were white. And then about the same time, a white person would come in and apply for the same job. And since there was already now a labor shortage, the black would be turned down and the white person would be hired. It was pretty irrefutable evidence. We had a number of such cases. And even an investigator came out from Washington and there was going to be a hearing. But uh, the cogs got ground up and there never was such a hearing. So that all of this evidence was simply collected in vain. And just like many other industries, during the war, no government action resulted in clearing up or improving that situation. When the war came along, I had to uh, romantically tried to enlist in the Air Force. I had a wife and a small child, and they counseled me not to be consistent on enlisting. And then time went by, and I joined the Merchant Army. So I spent the remainder of the war years on liberty ships in various parts of the world. And because I had gotten in high school as far as algebra, that was a shame to say, as far as I ever got in arithmetic or mathematics, uh, I was pulled into a training course for communications officers, which meant by the merchant army used to be called Sparks, and it was the person who pumped the key, the Morse code key in the, in the, in the radio shop. And uh, on the merchant ships, there was nearly always a Navy crew, so there would be a Navy radio operator and a, and a merchant radio operator who would, would share, share the work. The maritime unions, like the railroad unions, were divided. The unions that were close to the new CIO, the outstanding one in this case was the East Coast National Maritime Workers, were strenuously pushing against racial discrimination. And the other craft unions, a lot of people within the enemy itself were opposing this. So there was often a, a kind of a, of a little battlefront on ships. I remember going on one ship, this was fortunately an NMU. It's a ship that was organized by the CIO East Coast Sea And as everybody was getting aboard the ship and bringing on their sea bags, and the ship was loaded, getting ready to go out into a convoy in the Atlantic, uh, a black sailor came aboard and was assigned to the focuser uh, with a white seaman. The white seaman went in fury to the mate in charge on deck, and then he was referred by the mate to the NMU business agent. I forgot what his title was. And he was a young white kid from the South. And he said, well, you know, I never, I, I don't want to do this. I can't do it. I can't share a bedroom with a focus on 
with a black person. It's bad enough to have to work on the tech with that person. I said, I just won't do that. I'll have to move it somewhere else. So the answer on this ship was to refer him to the representative of the union who said, well, okay, Sonny, uh, pack your sea bag and go ashore. If you don't want to ship on the ship, we'll put somebody else in your place. Well, if he went ashore, he was going to be picked up by him by the uh, uh, for overstaying his leave on the shore, and then he was suddenly being drafted into the uh, GI. <laughs> so as he, he thought it over, and he found that he was able to do it somehow. And, uh, and he did. And there were, there were no further collisions, I don't mean there were no further collisions anywhere, but those two people worked out their problem. And it was the unquestioned, well, let me put, turn this around. What made that workable out for those two people was that this was the way things were done on that ship, and there was no even consideration of any other alternative to it. And in many cases, that wasn't the case, and then we very often had bitter conflicts and struggles. One of my friends had gone through the, the training and the... Uh, no, he became not a, a radio operator, but a, a person. And persons on merchant ships in those days were the people who did all the medical work. And they had about two weeks training and they were looking through a manual of what to do with somebody who gets appendicitis and stuff like that. So they were not highly skilled medical operators, but he wanted to be a doctor and this was a start. And he went out of his way to get on the first American ship since the Civil War, certainly, that had a black skipper. <laughs> that was the Booker T. Washington, a Liberty ship, which was launched about 1942. And the man who became the skipper, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, that's a long time back, he was quite famous at the time, had been a seaman since he was a child. And he had master's papers, but he was shipping as a steward, that is, as somebody who rustled up the food. He had never been put in command of a ship. Well, in the same new deal during the war, put him in command of a ship, and Booker T. Washington had a long and distinguished career. I didn't have to give up to being on the first ship that had a black skipper, but I was, I think, on one of the first ships that had a black chief radio officer. And he was a man, fine, marvelous guy, who had been through, he was older than I, been through the Depression, the early period of been on picket lines and was pretty strong in the military. And, stuff. and he, he had uh, quite intense diabetes, which he spoke of laughingly by saying his nickname was Sweet Pea. But at any rate, he was the chief radio operator. And I remember the voyage I made with him. We came across the English Channel into Antwerp. This was about 1940, early 1944, I guess it was before. The one the beach had landings. No, it's after the one the beach had landings. And this dock port was being uh, buzz bombed, not very effectively by the Germans. And all of the, this had military cargo. Every ship I was on had some kind of lethal cargo, 10,000 pounds of hand grenades or aerial bombs or whatever it might be. And so they had the naval or military officers on, on board who as well as a partial crew from the Navy who did things that the Navy was supposed to do, like man the guns on the ship. But there would be a military officer, and this was a captain in charge of the cargo for the Army. So at any rate, the captain, this was a captain who was based in Antwerp, and he'd come aboard to take charge of the unloading. And he was one of the officers' quarters because it was often possible for somebody visiting the ship to find the captain get a free drink, and that was probably what he wanted. But at any rate, he was up there, and he was an affable, pleasant man, with a big, uh, what would have been, 38 sidearm. And uh, he wandered into the cabin where the chief radio operator, nobody was on duty, the ship was a dock, was sitting washing his socks or something like that. And I was very close next door, and I heard this voice, hey, I don't mean to be anti-Southern, but it was a strong Southern accent. Hey, hey, there's a nigger from the officer's quarters. And that uh, was like a, you know, sort of galvanized me and the Navy was on duty, charged in the, you know, that room. And my friend, Emma May, who was the chief operator, was got up from 
of his chair and said, say that again, one of us won't leave this room alive. And meanwhile, some other people had made him a mate, and a few others were sort of crowding in. And uh, I don't know what the officer would have done. He wasn't a bad natured man, but he didn't reach for his gun, just for the money. And he said uh, a little alternately, well, I didn't mean to insult you, he said. But that's just the way we talk. He said, actually, I was a sucker line. Uh, and he fumbled by a great black man. Which I'm sure he may have gotten out of, out of reading rather than out of experience. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, this ended amicably too, and nobody got killed. But uh, when you multiply that experience, I mean, viewing it from him the maze point, you have been through an awful lot. And a lot of people who are in this position, or who are soldiers in the army, or the American military, have total, total segregation of black soldiers. There were no blacks in the Navy until after the Second World War, after the war was over, so far as I know. So at any rate, these are, these are, are some of the vignettes from that time period. And I see I've, uh, I didn't mean to go so long, but it's 2 o'clock, and I, I'll uh, save a couple of things to sum up with, but maybe some, if somebody wants to ask me a question or two. I probably should should stop running off uh, in formal lecture if that's what this is about and respond to questions. Yes, and then. Uh, I just wondered, you, you were at Chicago, and uh, I remember saw, something that Saul Alinsky said about the University of Chicago, the, city, uh, the sociology department, the mm -hmm. people. And he said uh, concerning Chicago, you find out as much. You know, you, you want to know what you mean. Some, some sociology professors have plotted all the house of prostitution in the city. So you, know, so you want to know where the whorehouses are, and you can't go out and tell you that. You know, so, uh, an, an education there was mm -hmm. superfluous. Well, you were later an organizer, and of course he was an organizer. I just wondered if you ever met Solomon's. No, I never met him, but I, I heard his name, not then, not until afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, I know what he was saying. There used to be sociology courses that would take uh, tours, and everybody would sign up for the course for these tours down to the the, uh, the nightclub and red light district of Chicago. <laughs> there, what was the name of the doctor who sounded forth in Bunhouse Square? He was quite a thing. He was kind of a, an old wobbly and an anarchist, uh, and he was a medical. Per he, I think he actually was a medical doctor. He took care of the prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And he would shock the, the, the daylights out of these groups of students who came down. Um, but that didn't result in changing the situation. No. Well, no, I, I didn't know. No, no, I was just curious. But Possibly. I, I didn't know. I Two old radicals, you know, yeah. Chicago. And uh, I didn't know Studs Terkel, although. He you did? Was, I did not. Oh. Although he was uh, beginning his career, yeah. his career. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, I'm interested in the history of the Holocaust. Yes. Would you say, I think it's fashionable to say today that the race, the, the race issue has changed a lot. Um, I mean, visu visually speaking, we see African Americans in many walks of life now with many opportunities. Mm -hmm. Some are living affluently, um, so I make a lot more than public school teachers like myself do. And uh, you have an interesting personal contrast, because by acquaintance you saw an earlier era, whereas we read about it in books for the most part. I mean, is the difference today morally important? Morally important? Yes. How significant is the change with more affluence, more positions of power? Mm -hmm. so? Good question. I think it's crucially, I think it's very different. But not uh, not by, well, I got my very in the wrong place. It's different, but not as different as it should be, let's put it that way. And here I'm sort of giving away my stance about uh, the relation between history and the utopian and writing. I think should, things should be better in this country now than they are. I think that in a number of ways, particularly in cosmetic ways, a great deal of progress has been made. In the time period that I'm talking about, of course, there was no TV, but on in advertising, or unless you went to Harlem to a, to a theater in Harlem, there were no black performers. There was a terrible fight at the when was it towards the end of the Second World War, just after to get the first black baseball player. 
There were no blacks on football teams. There were no blacks in colleges. There were very, very few. So the, the, the affirmative action program, yes, has opened a few doors, and, and there are a lot more blacks who have had the opportunity, and I should also say women who have had the opportunity, to get into jobs that are middle class and professional and more lucrative than uh, what serving hamburgers and McDonald's. But at the same time, it seems to have checked there, and the, the class relationship in many ways has deteriorated, it seems, in the United States. That is, the, the United States is far wealthier, just infinitely wealthier, than it was all when you think of all that stuff that produced for the Second World War. Think of the wealth that that represented. It was enormously productive. But in terms of individual average income, much better off than in the Depression or during the war or at the end of the war. But the average is deceptive because it, it covers a much greater span between people who are at the top of the pile and people who are at the bottom. And probably the vast majority of blacks in this country are economically on the bottom of the pile, even though a certain number of them have been able to move into a more creative, more affluent kind of, kind of employment. So in some ways, I see the situation as worse because um, it has opened up opportunities for a very small number of blacks, but worsened the situation for a lot of people, black and white, who are on the bottom of the, of the economic plan. If I could intercede half a second to add another dimension to Alex's answer. Last night we were having dinner together and I asked him, I asked him uh, if he had a direct mental image in his mind of when the Brown versus Board of Education decision came down in 1954. And Alex said that, that he remembered distinctly a certain kind of optimism about how things would change. He did not anticipate the degree to which there would be resistance. Yeah. Um, it seemed to me a, a revolutionary thing. It obviously overturned what had stood for centuries as the American way of doing things. And in many ways it was very successful, but then it came up against this enormously ingrained resistance. So when I said a little while ago that I, through working in industry, that's how it came to me, but that's not the only way it could come. How central white supremacy, racism is to American culture. That is, it applies not only to blacks, it applies to other racial minorities. Yes. We hear today that the middle class is shrinking as the disparity between those who have and those who do not have increases. That the those who have have more and more and more. And you take away from the middle class, which means the middle class is becoming lower class. Some of them are, yeah. And unless something happens to change that direction, we are going to have a very large lower class that's going to incorporate into it many, many more white or at least non non black, non 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 whatever. Yeah, I um, think this is excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, what do you what do you see as the ultimate consequence of that? God knows. <laughs> I, I wish I'd had an answer to that question, because it seems to me the problem is not just within the United States, but worldwide. And uh, it's exacerbated by the impact since the Second World War of uh, the ecological crisis. So that every cure that uh, our nations have, and I'm not just talking about the United States, for poverty, is to increase production, to speed up the competition with other countries, to produce more, to get more people working and get more ore out of the ground and all those things. Which brings us closer and closer to a time when there's going to be, I would say, grinding all the sense of instant, but a grind down where it won't be possible to expand. Our total uh, um, way of controlling uh, social hostilities and conflict in this country, this is true of Europe too, parts of the world as well, has been expansion, growth, if you will. 
If the pie gets bigger, then you don't have to change the class structure or the way in which uh, the rewards of the society are divided up for everybody to get a little bit more. And we've been able to do this up until very recently. So the, the intensity of class conflict, which we're just barely beginning to get in this country at this point, I think will be, will be very, very large. I was, uh, I won't, well, amused, but uh, that isn't quite right. I was impressed and struck by reading in New York, or certainly in the journal of the national middle class, uh, an article by, I forgot who wrote it, I should have brought that along, in which she's saying that <laughs> Marx is becoming back into fashion, and people in Wall Street are reading Marx, and he quoted a number of them. And he was saying precisely, well, precisely isn't right here, he was saying that the applicability of the Marxian criticism of capitalist exploitation is in many ways more cogent now, in 1997, than it was in 1897 or in 1848, or whatever year Marx, Marx wrote that book, Marx wrote during the mid 19th century, and that while Marx may have been totally wrong on his predictions about how a socialist society could be organized, actually he didn't make any predictions on that, so he can't really be held for urging the wrong thing. But let's put it another way, that for people who did try to organize a socialist society, it hasn't worked out very well. But this does not remove the cogency of the capitalism, but unfortunately it doesn't tell us where to go. And so I guess I would, in general terms, respond that I don't think there's any hope for the amelioration of the situation until we can figure out a way of eliminating increasing human exploitation in our society. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Socialism, of course, thought it had the answer and proposed simply elim eliminating the profit market. But uh, if you look around, us today, it would be hard to imagine how you could even uh, get a gallon of gas in a car if you were to make problem. We all are, are functioning within that level. Not a very good answer, but I don't have an answer. Yes? So what happened to your views on communism? I'm sorry, what? What happened to your views on communism and socialism? Oh, all right. That's where I was going to come to it. Yeah. Uh, I'll do that right now. Unless, uh, I'll take one other question first, and then I'll Yes. Might we not be discussing the demise of the utopian imagination as you describe it, in the sense that as you equate it with radicalism, and there's a fair amount of hope to that, and I think a great deal of humanity, wouldn't you suggest that in, in today's world, where we're so disconnected, that there are very few people who think in terms of hope for the future, mm -hmm. as, I, as I talk to friends and so on, there's a fair amount of us saying, well, I think we picked the right time to live. And, 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 and the, the real tragedy is we're not, we're not looking to a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're getting off the spaceship at about the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, the, you know, maybe in a sense we lost a good deal of this in the 60s when the radicals failed to tie in with the, the work. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me there was more hope, real hope, in the 30s among caring people than there is now. I think that's true, yes. I think the sense of, uh, of identification, I can remember it, it seemed to me as a young person that it wasn't at all frightening just to jump off and take my chances in, in getting whatever kind of job I might get. That there was something going that you could live in in society. Whereas now the attitude seems to be that unless I can get my hand on it right now and I have a special niche for myself, I'm lost and we start everything and go. I think that's true. I think that probably a certain amount of a certain a I think utopianism is part of, of human consciousness, so I don't think that it's going to vanish. I mentioned earlier a tension between utopianism that sees salvation in the afterlife after the death, and utopianism that sees the changing of society right here. I think that tension has always existed. I think in periods like the one we're in now, where any sort of immediate change in the social order seems almost hopeless, almost beyond reach. But you get an increasing focus, and well, it'll, it'll be all right for us afterwards. And since God has taken care of us, it doesn't really matter. 
much what happens to planet Earth if it, if it uh, falls and falters. Um, now, hopefully, I hope that they're not going to swing again, not necessarily to discarding religion as Martha advocated, but uh, to a sense of social responsibility for the way in which the world is right now. I better come to the question that the young man asked me there when you run totally beyond my, my time span. What happened to that afterwards? Well, uh, let me get into that by one slight indirection. I've been writing something or other ever since I was about 16, I guess. So the part of what I've always tried to do has been to interpret my experience in writing. I started out writing novels. And I wasn't, well, I did earn quite a good living first novel. The second novel was a novel in which I focused on the problem of discrimination on the railroads in Chicago in the early war years, and that is its central character of communists, two times, and they all think it. And uh, that book was enthusiastically accepted by a publisher in about 1947, but the time it came off the press was 1948, and in the meanwhile, machinery of the Cold War had locked worldwide into shape. So the publisher looked the other way. And they sold, I think, probably not more than uh, a few hundred, maybe six or eight copies in the United States. So instead of earning a living from royalties on my novel, I had to look around for a job in Warren County, and that was how I became a carpenter. When Jonathan said that I worked with the labor movement, I worked as a carpenter, and eventually I became a local officer in the carpenter's union. And that affected my experience, and I got some of that into writing, too. Why did I go across the bay and become a professor? Because I couldn't learn a living as a writer, and that was in part due to the fact that I was blacklisted to a considerable extent. The uh, second novel I wrote was about the shipyard struggle in San Francisco, which I had encountered directly, in which large numbers of black workers were excluded from the unions and from job promotion. At one point, San Francisco black workers put on a strike in wartime, which subjected them legally to the treason charges. They shut down shipyards, fortunately for them, I suppose. Well, they backed off and went back to work. One sense of tragic outcome, and another you know, say their situation, for they kept them all from going to jail, let's put it that way. And that laid the basis, in part, for the movement that came afterwards, the civil rights movement, followed long after the, after the Second World War. Uh, so what's my attitude about uh, about uh, my radical views in the early time? I haven't changed very much. Uh, the thing that's changed for me, and that's partly because I'm 80 and not 22, is that I'm not out on picket lines or trying to organize much of anything. I haven't been for some years. But my views of the situation are not very, very different. I'll read you, uh, I think, of a couple of pages from the introduction of the Great Midland. This is the introduction I wrote two years ago, 50 years after the book was first written or published. And when I learned it was going to be published, I was delighted. And writing the introduction for it was one of the most difficult things I've ever undertaken because it seemed to require me to look back over 50 years. I think I'll come directly here to a, uh, a, another personal anecdote before I read that portion. I talked earlier about what you learn from graduate students. Hopefully they learn things from you. Um, when I was teaching at UCLA, one of my graduate students, actually her, her dissertation was done in American Studies, so I was a member of her committee, but not the, not the chair. It was a young woman named Constance Coyne, who uh, did a brilliant dissertation, worked with me on her American history and labor history in preparation for it. And while she was uh, working on this, she, more or less by accident, ran across in the library the great movement, which had been published 49 years earlier, and recognized my name on it and read the book. And uh, she identified not with the hero of the book, who was a male communist, but with the, the uh, female hero, the heroine of the And she came to me and talked to me about it and said, and I, I, she gave me a perception of it that, that I had not had. Uh, 
This is an addendum that I wrote to the introduction, which is directed particularly to Constance Kleiner. She was in largely instrumental for getting the two novels republished, I should say that at this point. The introduction that precedes this commemoration was originally intended as an afterword. The real introduction to the second edition of The Red Mitten was to have been written by Constance Coyner, a young scholar now teaching American literature and women's history, women's studies at the State University of New York in Binghamton. Constance Coyner had done her doctoral work at UCLA, where I had the good fortune to be a member of her dissertation committee. As a scholar, Constance Coyner was intense and thorough. As a literary critic, she was relentlessly probing and unerringly constructive. I think she was the most gifted teacher I have ever known. My relation to Constance was mediated through a third person who actually existed only in our respective imaginations. The fictional character Stephanie Kodiak in my novel The Great Midland. I had already been working several years with Constance on her dissertation research before I learned that she had even read the Red Medley, then long since out of print. Happening on the novel in the library, she explained to me, she identified parts of her own life with Stephanie Kovia, whose story somehow opened for her doors of possibility. I might have been inflated with pride at this information, but instead I felt rather humiliated, because although I had in a sense created Stephanie Kovia, I had not known she possessed such powers until Constance Coyner pointed them out to me. Thus it was from Constance I learned that Stephanie was really the central character of my novel. <laughs> I could never have written what I wrote about Stephanie Kodiak in the introduction, which I won't quote from, had it not been for Constance's critical perception of Stephanie. Along with her other multiple enterprises, Constance took up advocacy of the Great Midland that the novel is being republished 50 years after its first run is due in large part to her relentless but good-humored badgering of potential publishers. That she did not herself write the introduction is because, with her 12-year-old daughter, Anne, she died in the crash of the TWA Flight 800 off Long Island in 1996. My wife and I, like many others, loved Constance and wept at her death. During almost 80 years of living, we had accumulated some familiarity with death. One of our two daughters died of cancer. In that case, after a year of struggling and suffering, death wore for her the gentle disguise of rational and benign resolution. O oh, sane and sacred death, as Walt Whitman wished to believe it. I have never encountered death so starkly and the insane, insane contingency and arrogance of death, as in the deaths of Constance and Anna. Among Constance's, here I'm going to get indirectly to the question you asked in this next sentence. Among Constance's favored quotations were lines from Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist leader of the late 1930s who died in a fascist prison in Italy, in which he defines the summum bonum human existence as, quote, pessimism of the intellect held in tandem with optimism of the will. I am trying to will that optimism. This new printing of the Great Midland was dedicated to Constance Coyne, who, while she lived, helped to make the earth a saner and more sacred place. So I'll uh, sort of end with that, except to add a phrase to tie it particularly to your question. I guess I would hang my hat on that quotation from Antonio Gramsci. It seems to me both realistic and hopeful and contains my belief, I guess, that the utopian mood won't cease to be part of human consciousness and that it will somehow find ways, I don't have the answer to precisely how, to apply itself not only to what the what it used to call as the pie in the sky after death, but to the world that we live in now. Pessimism of the intellect, meaning for the historian or the writer of the novels, and two are intimately related. And where everyone else who lives and tries to form a picture of love, an absolutely realistic grasp to the extent of the individual's ability of what the real situation in the world is all its pessimistic likelihoods, and at the same time, 
a continuing ability to will emotionally and with the consciousness a commitment to possible improvement in the future. Okay, that uh, one to that.